Are we we are on chapter nine? Yeah, I feel like we were at the very end and we kind of felt like we sort of ran out of time. And Pavitra and Federica let us know if we're off here. Yeah, we were pretty close to the end. Um, have any of you guys read chapter 10? Because I have I have not. And I have to say the latter half of uh, the last week's discussion literally like went over my head. Like I got, I really did, could not follow it at all. Yeah, um, I think sometimes when we're when we're talking about um, uh, talking about like what's happening is, I will counter this earlier in the book. Sometimes what happens is we end up talking about things that come later on. Um, yeah, because uh, I found that when I was having this yes. say with introduction to statistical learning, it's like people getting really into what's the difference between reducible error and non-reducible error, and it's like well, it actually discusses it throughout the book because it's a really big concept. Um, so, you know, I think it's very easy with this kind of stuff to be like, oh, I don't quite understand that. And then you want to really investigate it. But the, but the thing is, is it will reintroduce it later on. Um, or hopefully it will. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen again. And... I do agree with this. This is very true. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm particularly bad for it, to be honest, personally. Um, so let's see. What, what we were talking about last week is uh, trying to create um, uh, uncertainty. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Yeah, I'm catching up. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, right. So essentially what we're trying to say is, so you've got, this previous, you've got previous models. Um, and you can use them to create uncertain use them to create more better understanding of uncertainty in your uh, well in your overall model because you can use them to build uh, well build simulations of your data and those simulations can then actually give you uncertainty in the things like the intercept beta coefficient which the para which parametrics don't give you because when you've got a parametric assumption um, uh, or, par or you've got, it's not parametrics, that's the wrong phrase. When you've got a uh, standard frequentist, you don't, you're assuming that you've just picked up the right data. Now, of course, the problem with simulated data is it's simulated, and it's simulated on the data you've got, but you've got data available also in, um, in the world in general. So we create this uncertainty by resampling based on the parameters that we've picked out from different models, which is what this is showing here. And then um, this here is showing us like basically the maximum likelihood in a way, which is all the different possible draws of the coefficients of alpha and beta. Uh, this is just one beta and one alpha as opposed to having multiple. But if you were thinking about it, you, could, you would do this across your whole data set. Of course, we can't demonstrate that because it'd be pretty difficult to visualize. Um, but uh, one of the ways that they, he shows this later on is that um, there are, uh, say, uh, so what he's showing is 100 draws of the line that's created by the alpha and the beta. So this is kind of like the, um, you know, you can see that it's basically trying to uh, take the different kind of simulations of the data based on the coefficients and then rebuild the um, re rebuild the model from the data that's already been given to it. Um, so that's how we create uncertainty within the, that's how we, we create the, so we, but essentially we're using the old model to create the posterior simulations and then we express uncertainty by the parameter or the function through the simulations of data based on what we've achieved from a previous model. Um, and then a lot of this is explaining how you go about doing that. So the first part is, well, you can do a normal prediction. It's just a straight up prediction and just say, say well, if I've got this particular model, um, what happens if we add some new data, which is in this case, the new data is growth. So um, if we go back up to the top quickly, um, uh, what 
you've got vote and growth, and those are just your two variables. So we're predicting vote. So if we just give it one value of growth, if we give one value, uh, this is why I shouldn't go up and down. Um, so if we just give one value, which is growth here, then what's our predict predicted uh, vote share, which is what we get here with its error and the quartiles, but that's what it gives us. Um, this is just a more manual way of doing the same thing. It's just showing that you that you get the same results. And then the linear uh, pred is basically doing um, a linear prediction of the same thing. Uh, again, it's just predicting, uh, it's predicting the same result, but what it's doing is resampling the data. And all it's giving, giving us is the um, different sample, 4,000 samples was based on for that one prediction. Okay. Um, and then uh, what, what we can see, that's, this is just visualizing it as a, uh, as a vector. Now, when we do this, the posterior pred, as opposed to the linear pred, it also allows us to build up the, um, the error terms, or well, that's what I believe it does, um, uh, which I believe Fred Frederica mentioned last week. And so that gives us basically the predicted value plus also the standard deviations and the probability, which you can pull out from this information here. Um, where is it? Posterior pred. There you go. Pause, that pulls out that data. And this is when you wrangle it into a data frame. Why pred? Where is the uncertainty? Anyhow, um, <clears throat> so that's about where we got to last week, wasn't it? Um, and here it's just showing that it's the different techniques for doing it. Um, what happens when it's robust? Does that use it means it uses, it uses the median? I believe so. Yeah, the the median and the yeah yeah because otherwise it start, it goes to the mean. The median and absolute. Okay, so then propagate the so this section here, propagating uncertainty, is about pushing the uncertainty in our predictions forward so that we're not just predicting a value, but we're predicting uncertainty with our value as well. Mm -hmm. So we, we get our, I can't remember where that post bit is. Is it really far up? Yeah. Oh, it's really, really far up. Posterior samples, yeah. So we create the posterior samples from this model at the top. So that gives us all this data. There's 4,000 yeah. of them. And so when we get down, back down to, where were we? Uh, that's a bit low, isn't it? No, one more. Oh, here we go. So, um, so we get down to the posterior. Where are we there? All right. 9.2.5. Um, so the posterior predictor is, so make uncertainty in a predictor. So what they're doing here is we're taking the coefficients, which is that we are assuming there's a mean of two in the growth and an SD of 0 0.3. Um, so we're creating, we're creating new values here. Sorry, a new column called growth in the posterior. Oh, I need to go back to the top. Right, let's screenshot that. Can you see that bit on the side? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've got it there over to the side. Yes. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Nine point two point five. Oh. <laughs> 
so it's having these columns inside, which is called growth, but, and then it's creating a prediction column as well. Oh, okay, okay. So basically, it's created a new value called growth. It's saying just so this is just some rat, some normally distributed versions of what it would expect growth to be, and then it's using that to create a new a new prediction as opposed to getting the algorithm. Sorry, as opposed to getting the function to do it directly itself, mm -hmm. and then it's summarizing those values. Um, would have been easier just to actually. <laughs> just to actually use the function, right? Um, but one second, <clears throat> can you go up to the mean, the formula for the mean? Uh, so yeah, that um, the B intercept plus B growth times growth. Uh, I have never seen a mean that looks like that. Is that fairly standard? Like, or I guess they've just used, uh, do you see the formula for the Y underscore spread? Yeah, so uh, is it, it's just trying to create the point prediction here if each value but, is in the, in the posterior. Well, so, well that, that, is that the mean though? That, you know, the formula B intercept plus B growth times growth, that looks like it's a, a coefficient times whatever, the slope or something, but why would that be called a mean? Like it's, does it? Unless I'm missing. It's the mean of the normal, right? So it's the mean of this. So if you look at the, it like this, it's wrapped up okay. here. So um, we've got a mutate statement, create y pred, yeah? yeah? But on this side of y pred is this. So we're, we're taking um, random normal uh, sampling from the normal distribution, basically, using mm -hmm. which is the length of this data this posterior data frame which is 4000 and we've got a mean um we've got um uh, and basically what the mean value that goes into that to say the, what is the mean of our um of our normal distribution which we're using is based on the regression formula yeah and, that's what i meant like it's mm -hmm. yeah it looks exactly like a regression formula is that normal Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because, um, so what's unusual here? This is actually, this is actually a really good point. I'm glad you raised it because I didn't really quite mm -hmm. think it through beforehand. What it's trying to do is it's showing us that when it's creating the growth, so we so growth we've just used um, for this one data point. We're saying we expect a growth of two, but we know from um, our um, our model further up that that should have a standard deviation around it of 0 0.3 yeah right, and right. so basically when we're sampling growth if, or making predictions on growth we need to mm -hmm. actually give it some uh, standard deviation or some variance and then with the Y predictor what we're doing is we're um, basically creating another another normally distributed pool based on what we'd, we would expect um, based on based on what we would expect to um, pull based on this information here but it's for each level of this information here so we've created um, we've created growth um, so is, hold on one second. Uh, um, August is mutate a vectorized function, so it is doing it for each entry in that uh, yes. in that vector. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So now that that makes sense. Okay, so it is vectorized. Just so it's uh, that that's how it's uh, arriving at that. Okay. Yes. So for the prediction on two percent growth, we've added variance in there with standard deviation zero three. Um, so we haven't just given it um, or hit the predicted values. 2.0 we've been given it the value value is 2.0 plus or minus um 0 0.3 which is remarkable in itself because we're not giving it a direct measure of what we expect our prediction to be um which is quite interesting and then what we're doing is using these coefficients which are 4,000 different pools with the 4,000 variances of 2.0 
or growth in order to predict, um, in order to increase, in order to add, uh, in order to add um, uncertainty right. into our, um, yeah, into our, yeah, into our value. So we've got uncertainty in both our, in, in, in both the additional information going in and also the models that we've created in order to create gotcha. the overall yeah. uncertainty of the prediction. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Christ. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, well, no okay. Does that does that does that does that make sense to everyone? Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah. That's a that's a pretty cool idea, actually. Uh, I hadn't thought of adding uncertainty into the um, value you want to predict on. Um, I mean, I suppose it could be error in the uh, me measurement error or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, simulating uncertainty in linear predictions and your observations. Right, so this is earnings database. Um, I'm not sure if I understood this last week. So this is the one to do education and what, and earnings? Is that right? Yeah. Oh no, weight and height. They use weight and height here. So yeah, which is quite weird. Um, So what do they do here? They oh yeah, so they move it so that you don't have a minus value at the intercept because that is strange to have a minus value. So they center the data um, at uh, the average height. And then they create a new formula, and basically we end up with for every increase in height above the average, we get. We add it by 4.95, okay. Um, so now we're creating prediction because this is what this is all about, right? Um, so if we've simulated several draws, we might use blah, 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 and that would give us this, these predictions based on the uncertainty in that. So essentially, I suppose that's the, um, that's the, what's it, the functional version of this thing up here. No, sorry, where is it? Yeah, what we were looking at before. Anyway, get rid of that. So what they've just done is showing us how the function works. Okay, so then we move on. Oh my God, there is actually loads of this. Uh, prior information and Bayesian synthesis. Uh, classical uh, statistical methods produce summaries and inferences based on a single data set. Yes, that's what we were talking about before. Uh, Bayesian methods uh, combine a model of data with prior Let's information. Uh, it's uh, this is this the Bayesian mm -hmm. formula, uh, or it's supposed to be? Yeah, right. It's where it's uh, combining the two to give you the yeah. Okay, so I think this is where it got wow. quite tri tricky yeah. last week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the problem is that this... That notation been... is seriously messed up. It didn't render... Is that like... Uh, it looks like it's tried to LaTeX it up or something. Yeah, yeah. it is LaTeX. It is, but it doesn't work. I think it's because he's done it so long ago, something else has changed, or uh, yeah. uh, maybe I'm using a different version from what he used. Uh, I this just... Is um... Knit the R, R markdown file. Let's see if it worked for me. Nope, I got the same thing you got. <laughs> okay, well, it must yeah, be the pa it must be the package. Yeah, it must be like so. his package version must be an older or something like that. I don't know. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, set out the priors. Okay. Do you, Stephen? Do you want Steve? Do you want to go over this? Because I think you'll probably be able to explain it a bit better than I can. Um, I will try to, sure. Um, so let's see, we are starting at, let me go back to your screen real quick. Oh. You're more than welcome to take control if you like. So Bayesian information aggregate. Okay, so here we go. Let's see if my screen sharing works. Ta-da, sorry. Uh, share screen. Uh, where is it? I'll just do the whole 
thing or Google Chrome. Okay. Do people see? Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. So let's see what yeah. was it they were doing here. So they say we have our prior values. Um, let's see. So this was information that we had based on some knowledge that we had previous to seeing data. And then uh, we have our new data estimates. Uh, so let's see, that's also just being calculated. We've got N equals 400, Y equals 190. Um, and so basically they're just combining the two together according to those formulas. Uh, so, okay, so what do we do with that then? So here we're saying find density values for prior likelihood and posterior. So what are they doing? So he's saying theta, we're going to go across from 0.35, 2 0.7, 200 long. Um, and again, we're doing the business of drawing random values normally distributed. Um, so we know what our theta hat prior is. So we use that for the mean and we have the prior standard deviation. So we use that there. And then we have the likewise for the um, data after we actually look at the data, uh, we know what that's going to look like. And then we have the results of combining the two. So it's just saying, okay, what does it look like as a distribution? Um, so, okay, for the annotation, what are they doing here? So they say, okay, theta this, theta this, theta this, um, and that's the, and then the label is going to be likelihood prior posterior. Um, I'm not entirely sure what this H just is doing, but we'll figure it out. Um, so, okay, so then it goes, um, doing our usual ggplot, so we have our theta is x, so as we see. Um, so we have one for our prior, one for our likelihood. Um, let's see, okay, so, so in the first plot, they're just saying, okay, we don't want the label to be posterior. We're leaving that out altogether. Um, y is density, label, label. And it's doing some other ggplot tricks there. Um, let's see what else is going on. So, okay, so then for this, the second plot is just trying to show what it looks like after you combine the two. So you can see, yeah, you've got a very wide sort of, a lot of uncertainty in the prior. When we get the data, we have a much better sense of what's going on. And then, you know, as always, the truth lies somewhere in between. <laughs> um, but, that is so cool, right? That's the first time I'm actually seeing it like, like translated as a code. That is yeah. I like these plots. Yeah, it, it, the way they did that is nice. And the, I think this is like what one, this is already several iterations. So like, does that posterior actually get fed back and then like it goes through more of these cycles or is this like the final whatever they ended up with? Well, for this particular analysis, this would probably be the end of, yeah. I, I know there's some cases where people do things iteratively. So as you get more data, you update what you know, your posterior will change. Gotcha. In this case, okay. Yeah, in this case, we're just saying, well, we have this information and then we actually collect the data and then combining the two, what, what do we get? So yeah, that's what's going on there. And how do they calculate the likelihood guys? It's the regular, I guess that's your standard formula, right? For likelihood. Yeah, the likelihood is just, yeah, you just, um, you know, it's just the result of your data itself. So in this case, you know, when they collected the data, they said the, the mean is this 
and the standard deviation is this, and it's just kind of assuming, I guess, that that's going to be normally distributed. So yeah, that's why they just, yeah, they're just, they're kind of simulating it. They're saying, oh, here's what this would look like, like that. That's really cool. So that's that first round. Then they say, let's see if we have less certain likelihood. So we just make this larger. Um, so they're doing the same thing they did before. Uh, so you have your prior and you have your data and you combine those. So you get the theta hat for the two of them together in the standard deviation or standard error, sorry. Um, and then we do the same thing with the plots. I'm curious with the GG plot, how are they getting? Uh, hold on, Steve, can you go up? Label right there. Uh, yeah, Steve, that's... can you scroll up a little bit, please, if you don't mind? Sorry. But... Yeah. Uh, one second. Uh, theta hat is. Oh, okay. That's just the switch. Yeah. Okay. And then HSH. Theta hat. Theta so the likelihood comes directly from the data, correct? It, there's no involvement of the posterior in the likelihood. Right, so the prior is your previous knowledge or you know what your, your starting point. Likelihood yeah. is, is purely based okay. on the data. And then you combine them and you get your posterior. So then you feed back your posterior as your prior. Is, it, is that right if you're doing it iteratively? So then it kind of gets fed back as a prior. Does that happen? Yeah, that happens in some applications, I feel like, yeah. Okay, okay, so that's not an out there idea. So it does happen. No, not not at all. I mean, then okay. you see the classic examples where, you know, they'll say, oh, we collected some data. Okay, we updated, now we know this. Yeah. Okay, we collected more data. Now it looks like that. Yeah, so just your, your probability distribution will change because you have more certainty. Sorry, what, can you repeat yeah. that? your probability distribution? You have more certainty? So like, so like, a, like an example I've seen used is like when people are talking about um, beta distribution and, and then it's like actually a sports analogy. So they would say, well, let's assume at the beginning that, you know, we would expect this player to have this batting average and you know, with this level of uncertainty, but then each time, you know, the player goes up to bat, you have more data. So it just kind of keeps feeding back in, right? So you're, so over time, your distribution will move and it will get, you know, narrower and narrower. So, so that would be kind of a, an example where you would do it iteratively. I see, okay. Yeah, I, there's, there's something David Robinson, uh, I, I'll post it. Oh, you know what? I do remember this, I think it, um, he cre it was a sports thing that he was, um, I forget what, what it was, but you know what? I know exactly what you're talking about. Hold on, I'll see if I can find it. David. I think it was a paid thing though. Like you have to pay for this. <laughs> Empirical base, examples from baseball statistics. Is that what you're thinking of? Is this the right? Baseball? Da yeah, David Robinson. I... It's called Inter uh, Introduction to Empirical Bayes, Examples from Baseball Statistics. Yeah. And actually, you know what, August? Oh, I think here that you go. I remember such this a cool one that I saw before. Yeah, oh, oh, this is a... Oh. You would start with something like this. So like, oh, this is this player based on his performance. We think he's going to do this. So that's your beginning. Um, but yeah, the way the way this updates, so this is actually a real nice distribution because the way it updates is very simple. So so every time they hit, you would either update, you know, this you would add one or or here you would add one. And just over time, you know, it would move and get more narrow. Gotcha. Speaking of which, I have his introduction to empirical base. Um, if yeah. you want to go through that, because it, it's all coming out of baseball, so it's like all sports analogies. So right. if people Sorry, like August, they, for using an American sport, but uh, anyway. yeah. But if anyone wants more of that, I have I have that document. I mean, I okay, paid for that. Cool. Yeah. It's basically rounders, right? 
Yeah, more or less. They hit the ball, they run around. <laughs> run around uh, the beach. Like cricket, but with more steps. <laughs> Crick, cricket, uh, similar. To <laughs> but it's not. I, I've had Indian friends, so I've seen cricket matches. So, yeah, they're very different. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, that, that's kind of, that's, yeah, one application of where you're feeding your data back in and then that keeps updating your distribution. Uh, and then beta is nice because it has this property, whereas otherwise you have to do things like simulations or, or you have integrals that are impossible to do. So it's just, yeah, this comes up as, as an example a lot. So does that kind of help? Is that reasonable? That was really helpful. Okay. That was wonderful. Thank you. No problem. Sure I'll read these materials tomorrow uh, on uh, additionally, but I, I think I kind of get it because we did kind of discuss this last week, which was, yeah, uh, as I understand it, is by having you get the likelihood from your model and the prior and the prior is the information that creates that, and then you kind of create simulations on those that right. allow you to create a posterior weight. No, that's right, around. <laughs> I'll have to right. it. And in, and in the context of regression, the way I'm understanding it, so you're saying, um, you know, you're using your computer to do simulations. So it's got the space that it can search. Um, and you know that some values are just completely observed. <laughs> so, so that's where you would say, you know, I would expect the mean to have this distribution. I would expect standard deviation to have this. So, so, so in that way, it's just kind of um, keeping your simulation under control. Okay. Yeah, is, is, is kind of what happens to my understanding with, yeah, the, like with Stan GLM or BRMS. Okay. I, I mean, I think I understand the general principle. Um, I, I think I probably need to go back over it just in order to understand it more fully. But um, it seems like a key point to, for the which kind of blocks everything else in some respects but mm -hmm. yeah theoretically i think i can follow so so yeah so then we had this interesting example um yeah so this was in the context of the way i was understanding this you know somebody published a paper and they said more attractive people have more girls oh, um God. And so these uh, authors did not really buy the results. They thought it, you know, they said, let's look at this. Is this reasonable? Um, so let's see. And then you see too, there's um, a couple potential issues with this study. Um, there's that whole class imbalance thing. So you might not have many people rated highly attractive. So that's like, you know, even though you might have a big sample size, the actual you know, highly attractive people might be very small. Um, so that was an issue. Uh, so, so they said, okay, let's just take the data and um, let's apply information that's totally outside of the data. So we know, um, you know, variation occurs as we all know, uh, typically more male children than women and, and, you know, they say, well, you know, when you compare between groups, you will see variations. So you see like 48% among whites and 492 among blacks. Um, and so what they're going, where they're going with that is they're saying, you know, okay, we know, we know it occurs. We, we've seen it, um, but we're using attractiveness, which is subjectively measured. We can't, you know, say, is it with the certainty that we could say whether you know somebody is black or white, um, you, you would have find it hard to believe that there would be you know a bigger difference than you know what you would see in, uh, in other you know more easily measure measurable things. Um, so what they did then they said okay, we say theta would be mean zero, standard deviation of 0.25. So that, again, that kind of reins it in. It's just saying, when you do your simulation, um, you know it's not gonna be a 3% difference. That's just completely absurd. Uh, so that kind of puts uh, guardrails on things. 
Uh, so let's see. On the percentage scale, the survey tells us 8%, which again, that's eh, pretty high. And then the standard error is 3%. So, you know, they got all excited because 8%, 3%. So they're like, oh, okay, we probably have something here. Um, and so it is saying, okay, the prior is much more informative than the data because the data standard error is 10 times the prior uncertainty. So yeah, that's uh, interesting. Because yeah, we, we have a very small one here, very small uh, uncertainty. Um, again, speaking to the small sample size and so forth. So going back, we had our equation. So we combine them, we get, okay, theta is very, you know, gets reduced drastically from 8% down to 0 0.06. And then standard error uh, comes up, does it come up? We said up here we wanted, yeah. Oh, okay, so I guess, yeah, because they were, yeah. So that's that. Um, okay, so the, so the last thing they do is say, okay, remember the sample size is 3000, all proportions have around 0.5. Um, so they're saying, and then this is, hard to read because it didn't render right, but it's just saying the standard error for a proportion near 0.5. Um, so, okay, so the two groups, I guess the attractive and the unattractive, oh dear. Um, uh, so we, we'd expect these probabilities to be close anyway. Um, so that would be, you know, on the order of this 0.018. Uh, but when you have uh, different size groups, you get a higher standard error. So if you were to set, you know, n equals 300 in the attractive group, so then, yeah, you have that thing we talked about, the imbalance, which you'd expect to see. Um, so, yeah, so that, you know, increases it from 0.018 to 0.03. So that, yeah, does that make sense, what, what they're saying there? I, believe it makes sense. <laughs> so anyway. So we, just just to be sure, clear, so what we're saying here is um, in order to create uh, the posterior, yeah, um, we're uh, superseding the information which was in the model from the data that was used to build the original model with um, mm -hmm. the value that we found elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so but, so what we're saying is we're making uh, a choice. Sometimes it's appropriate to make a choice to say, well, actually, there's greater data available that we can use to uh, to fill in the model. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was that was a specific example they did. So okay, so then they say uniform, weekly, informative, informative priors. Um, so yeah, when you do inference that's multiplied by a prior distribution to yield posterior, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, so this guy um, is saying, Mr. Kurtz, um, instead of using stand GLM, he's using BRMS. Uh, and he's saying, when you're using this, you can fit a model with uniform priors just by, you know, passing in these arguments. Uh, let's see. Uh, so then he gives uh, the guy who did this uh, Git, Git repository, GitHub repository, he's saying, well, you can't quite do the flat priors. Um, he's saying, by default, the priors of class equals B have a flat prior across the real number line. But for, yeah, so B would be the parameters, but the, um, the slopes, but the intercept uh, does not allow this. So he says, you can suppress the default intercept with this Y, you know, squiggle zero. Um, and then you could just add the intercept back in. So he just plays a little trick. He says, okay, I'm going to have no intercept, but I'm going to have something called intercept. Um, so in that case, you have the class that you could, 
So this, this is really just kind of inside uh, baseball on all the coding he's doing here more. Um, let's see. So for Sigma, he's saying you could set by default, sorry, you can set the lower bound at zero and I'm not currently aware of a workaround. And, and also it, it to me is it's like, it doesn't make sense anyway that you would have a uniform prior for sigma because it, it can't be negative. <laughs> so yeah, it would have to be a positive value. Um, so he says, okay, you cannot make it uniform, but you can use a uniform prior with a very large upper bound uh, so, okay, in that case, you have almost completely flat, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's that. Uh, so he says, okay, so here's how you would fit that model. I'm using flat priors for intercepting growth, so I don't need to state that. So he, he's got this new function. So he did the little trick and then intercept and growth are now considered like betas instead of, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, like a slope. Uh, or a uh, slope and intercept. So, okay, prior is uniform, zero, one, E15. Yeah, so he just got a very wide prior uh, for the sigma, for the standard error. Uh, and he's saying, here's the file we put in. And so he says, finally, let's print out the model summary. So you see the estimate, the estimated error, estimate, estimated error. Um, and so to make fun pictures, he does what we've seen before, uh, posterior samples, just renames A and B so we know what they are. Um, and then you get this warning because again, the library has changed apparently since he did this exercise. Uh, and then he's got, oh, okay. And so then you have this pretty picture here, which shows you sort of, yeah, you get, you know, most likely to be in this area here using the uniform prior. Uh, so what did he do then? So in this case, he's got, oh, okay, so he's got here, he did the initial plot um, here. What did he do a little differently? Yeah, so he's got stat ellipse. Here he's got um, geom point. So he gets this circle containing the 95% interval. And then finally, he gets, yeah, just the posterior draws. So he's just pointing, yeah, just showing all the plots. All right. How are people doing? We're at four o'clock, actually, I'm noticing. Are we close to the end? I think we are. <laughs> so, how are people feeling? Keep going. <laughs> it's fairly a lot to take, and I have not read the chapter, so. Oh, uh, okay. I kind of feel like, yeah, hmm. I'm okay to keep going, um, but um, it really does depend on what other people want to do. Yeah, I probably can't go too long, to be honest. Yeah, because I have to do a couple things before I head out this evening. Maybe we could do, let's see, default prior. Let's see what he does real quickly. Weekly informative. Okay, so this is what we saw before. Yeah, look at this, it's very interesting here. <laughs> the uncertainty is just insane. Uh, let's see. Uh, that doesn't actually show up on mine. What's that? That doesn't actually show up on mine. Oh, does it not show up? No, I don't know why. Oh, okay, interesting. That's weird. Yeah, I just re I just rendered it before, right? I think I rendered it when we started talking. Hmm. 
so this is this only covers really um, the last three pages, which are more kind of examples of the theory that we've done before, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so I mean, we could kind of just uh, go back and have a look on our own, perhaps. I don't know. It, I, I'm just thinking, like, we've been on this for... Um, yeah, like, so we might be wanting to move on to 10 next time. I, yeah, ideally. It'd be good to move. It would be good to move forward, I think. Um, yeah, I would be good to do that. Does everybody want to just kind of move on? Uh, maybe just kind of cover this on just kind of a homework level. <laughs> we can maybe yeah. discuss it briefly and then, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm ready to move on as well. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm, what, I'm, one of the things I was going to ask is, um, yeah, are, are, we discussed before about um, a lecture series. Yeah. Yeah, who, who, who was that? Was that for a different author? We were talking, I, I was mentioning that um, the guy who wrote Statistical Rethinking, Miguel Ray. Oh, yeah. He's got him online. Um, and then that talks about, you know, Bayesian approach to, although it's different, he's using different uh, sort of libraries and everything. But the, the concepts are the same, more or less. I was just thinking I might just go through those lectures yeah, yeah. To, in order to help me read the rest of this book because. I they, think they go well together, I would say, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I was just thinking, like, if I was able to go through those lectures, then it right. might help to speed up my kind of theoretical understanding of what's going on. And then, like, that will help move the book forward. Right. So, so for example, so, like, in McElroy's book, he, he explains things like, you know, what, what even does this R hat mean? And <laughs> some of the other things. So... So yeah, the two of them together, I think, work well, very nicely in, in okay. the whole concept of, you know, the chains and how you evaluate your simulation. Um, the regression and other stories, I think they're, which, which I like about regression and other stories is they talk about conceptually what, you know, why are you doing all this and, and what does it mean? Yeah, so I think the two of them together, good books to read, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, on his GitHub, yeah, for statistical rethinking, he's got a uh, statistical rethinking, a Bayesian course with code in R, Stan, Python, and Julia. Oh, he's got um, Python and Julia also. Wow, interesting. Okay, and he's got the 2019 lectures up there as well. I just share this, but he might have changed some of the stuff as well. He changed uh, the oh, book slides and videos. Lot, in fact, yeah, it's all here. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize. So this might, because I was just thinking, you know, sometimes I've got like, when I'm watching, when I've got models building, I've got time to yeah. uh, watch a video or two. That's good. To, okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I'll flag that one. I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. I think we're good. Okay, um, yeah. I, I mean, I th I think I'm kind of getting the hang of some of this. Um, the, the maths does not stick in my br my head so much, um, particularly that section on the um, on the where it says expressing data and prior information on the same scale and how you combine those together. But mm -hmm. I think that's more of a case of if I do some just play around with it I think I'd probably understand that and then following those other links that you guys have put up would be probably will help yeah it would probably probably help yeah I think um but yeah next week's um hopefully we can do the multiple uh, linear regression with multiple predictors that that's quite a bit more complicated but um I mean it's really just an extension of the same thing isn't it yeah yeah just talks about how you would interpret them and use them. Hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks very much, Steve.